Hi, everybody. Welcome. Thank you so much for taking your time to be here at the Me Too panel. My name is Lena Jaswa. I'm a professor here in the School of Communication, and um, I am the SOC Inclusion Officer. Uh, this is the first of many, many events that the Diversity Committee in the School of Communication is putting on this semester. And at the end of the um, presentation, I'll give you some more um, of the things that are happening. But um, what I wanted to do is actually start off with a quote um, first. So. I will never forget the look on her face. I will never forget the look because I think about it all the time, all of the time. The shock of being rejected, the pain of opening a wound only to have it abruptly forced closed again. It was all on her face. And as much as I love children, and as much as I cared about that child, I could not find the courage that she found. I could not muster the energy to tell her that I understood, that I connected, and that I could feel her pain. I couldn't help her release her shame or impress upon her that nothing that happened to her was her fault. I could not find the strength to say out loud the words that were ringing in my head over and over again as she tried to tell me what she had endured. I watched her walk away from me as she tried to recapture her secrets and tuck them back into their hiding place. I watched her put on her mask back on and go back into the world like she was all alone and I couldn't even bring myself to whisper, me too. These are words from Tarana Burke, who's the founder of the company Just Be Inc., but also the real uh, spark that created the Me Too movement. So we're really um, glad that we were able to get such great panelists for this, this timely topic. And the way that it's going to work today is I'm going to introduce our panelists, and then um, they're going to talk for a few minutes about their respective fields and what's happening in the fields and some of the research that they've been doing. And then I'll ask them a few questions and then we'll open it up for Q&A um, at the end. So there will be time for, uh, for you all if you have any thoughts or questions to, to jump in. So our first panelist is Professor Jane Hall. And I'm reading brief things of their bio. You can go onto the AU's website and find SOC's website and find out more information. Um, Jane specializes in media and politics, especially, uh, she's especially interested in the depiction of women in media and politics, media ethics, and popular culture. She was formerly a weekly commentator on, fa on the Fox News channel, and she's appeared regularly on CNN's Reliable Source, MSNBC, PBS, NPR, C-SPAN. And she was a journalist for the Los Angeles Times, uh, where she was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize. Thank you, Jane. Um, Professor Molly O'Rourke is the director of the MA program in political communications and is an executive in residence. She has 15 plus years of experience in the field of public opinion research. She's done much research looking at advocacy in nonprofits and trade associations, political candidates, and media outlets. And for several years, she's co written a monthly column um, about the trends in public opinion and political behavior for the Hill newspaper. Thank you, Molly. And finally, but not finally, obviously, <laughs> we have <laughs> Professor Russell Williams, who is our Distinguished Artist in Residence. He's won two Academy Awards for his sound work with Glor on the films Glory and Dances with Wolves, and has worked on over 50 films, including Training Day and Field of Dreams. He was the first African American to receive multiple Academy Awards in any category, and as of 2014, he is one of three African Americans to have won two Oscars. Welcome, Russell. Good morning. Thank you. So I'm going to hand it over to Jane, and uh, Jane will start, and we'll just gonna, we're just going alphabetically, and, um, and so there we go. Okay. Yeah. Um, I had a couple of thoughts, and they're just thoughts basically for us to think about. <coughs> I'm the representative of, of journalism here in my field, and it's what I've covered, and it's what I've worked in. I do think we are at a cultural moment mm -hmm. when businesses decided that it was no longer a good thing for them to be associated with Bill O'Reilly. That is an important moment. I think when Mark Halpern, Charlie Rose, uh, and other high profile people lose their jobs, lose their book contracts, lose other associations with news organizations, that is a culturally significant moment. It does feel as if it is cascading in the sense that more and more women feel that they can break their silence and be believed. I was honored a couple of years ago here to be able to interview Anita Hill, uh, and she said women and people who report abuse need to be believed. And we, I think we may, have, we may have reached a moment where people feel as if they are not at fault, and they have to work on that, but stepping forward is happening more and more. So I do think the media are highly symbolic. 
uh, highly important uh, industries in terms of the symbolism, the role modeling, who's the anchor matters. You know, it's, it, it's important that the Today Show has two women now. That is a big deal. Um, so all of that is very good. Uh, on a personal note, I, 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 some of these people I knew and know as a journalist, and I was shocked to read particularly about uh, Charlie Rose, uh, but also about Mark Halperin, that they thought that these were relationships, that these were feelings that were reciprocated right. by women that worked for them whom they were sexually practically assaulting, according to the stories. So I think the media deserve a lot of credit, particularly the New York Times, Emily Steele, uh, and you know who broke the Vice story as well as the Bill O'Reilly story. Um, the news media deserve credit for bringing this forward. And um, we also know that unfortunately, this is true of legacy media, old media, new media, conservative media, liberal media, um, NPR, other places. So I think these are all good trends, but my main concern is um, where is the systemic change? And, and um, ABC uh, announced you know, that they were firing Mark Halpern, but then uh, they said they, had, you know, they hadn't had any complaints against him, and it was a long time ago. I mean, I'm being a little unfair in my characterization. NBC is conducting an investigation of uh, Matt Lauer. I would love to know, is that going to be made public? Uh, I would love to know, um, I mean, Charlie Rose is a particular case because his little production company pretty much appears to have allowed him to have a very closed system uh, and a preying on interns, which is something that I've heard from people in our business. I was even talking to a colleague of mine who said she had counseled people about uh, being hit on at conferences by, prof uh, by professors. So this, uh, my concern is this is not just a few high profile casualties. When are we going to see the change? When are we going to see better representation of women and minorities in the media? so that the power structure is not all men in charge and men having influence. Thank you, Jane. Um, Molly, can we turn it over to you? Sure. So um, my perspective or my contribution here is to talk about how this issue has played out um, in the industry that we call politics. So um, media and Hollywood and politics seem to be the three industries that have received kind of the initial round of attention in <coughs> this new movement that we're in. Um, I will say, just on a personal reflection, I am, I think this is a very important, obviously it's a very important dialogue, it's a very needed um, movement and needed conversation, but I find it incredibly discouraging and depressing. Yeah. And I say that as somebody who likes to be part of um, solutions and constructive engagement and progress, but um, I hope Jane is right that this is a moment and um, that this is transformative. The reason I say I find it discouraging and, um, and somewhat depressing is that I thought we were having this moment 27 years ago when I was a Capitol Hill staffer right out of college and worked in the Senate during the Clarence Thomas and Anita Hill hearings. And for me, that, I, I thought that was our moment. And if you would have asked me then, I was you know, right out of college in my young 20s and said, do you think in 27 years you'll be sitting on a panel having a conversation about um, members of Congress still having access to a fund to make um, uh, victims of sexual harassment go away quietly with um, non-disclosure agreements? I, I really, I, I wouldn't have thought that we would still be wrestling with a lot of these very fundamental issues. Um, and so I am hopeful that this, perhaps we've had some false starts along the way. There have been some high profile incidents, they get attention, it seems like it's solved, and then we move on. And so I'm hopeful that this isn't gonna, going to be one of those short um, attention span. Uh, and I think there's evidence that it is, but I also feel as though um, having, having kind of lived through that in my introduction to politics, the Thomas Hill hearings, I left Capitol Hill, went to Emily's List in 1992, create, you know, helped to be part of what we felt the year of the woman, that we were never going to go back to having a 
all male, all white male judiciary committee that couldn't understand, even if they believed that those things happened to Anita Hill, they couldn't possibly understand how a woman who's obviously intelligent wouldn't have felt powerful enough to speak up. It was mystifying to, to senators who believed Anita Hill, and it was not mystifying to their staff um, to know that intelligence and power are not equal things. Um, and um, I, I, um, I guess I just, um, my, my hope is that um, the kind of continued attention to this issue um, and the substantive progress that needs to be made beyond the reactions to headlines and um, very high profile people um, and that is an easy thing to coalesce behind and sort of express outrage over. But the systematic change that needs to happen in daily interactions that aren't um, necessarily on a morning news set or in a Senate office, but are in offices all around the country, I think that's what the next step is. And I think that's where we're at real risk for not taking this conversation that we've started and moving it forward. And my sincere hope is that we're able to, but I think that's really the challenge uh, that we face. Thank you. Russell. Well, um, thanks for coming, everyone. Uh, I just want to put a caveat in front of my remarks. I'm not here to mansplain. <laughs> I'm actually very honored to be on the uh, dais with these distinguished colleagues of mine. And uh, I can say from a personal note, going back to when I was an undergrad here in the 70s that I don't know any women that were close enough to me to confide in me that haven't experienced some unwanted attention all the way up to criminal activity. And this is even before I left to go to Los Angeles in 79. I had a very best friend uh, from Wilson High School uh, was raped at gunpoint and sh she wanted me to go with her to the trial and the trial was over in Virginia. And the way they basically turned her into, you know, this, this horrible thing that induced this person to pull out this weapon and, and rape her. And, you know, she was a law student at Georgetown. I mean, she's, she's in the judiciary right now. And I was thinking, so you go to the system that's supposed to protect you and this is how you're treated. So I, I already knew that it was a stacked deck. Uh, while I was a student here also, in what we call our media production center, we created a volunteer workshop that was called Spirits Known and Unknown. And the co-host who I just saw um, a couple days ago, who is a retired federal judge now, one of our first rules was, we will not date or hit on the female volunteers because A, it's volunteer, so if Say, for instance, if Molly moves from being a trainee to on air, is it because Molly moved because she's a better writer or is it because Molly and I are dating? So we already saw that problem back in the 70s and that's how we operated. I had worked at Channel 4 during the Watergate hearings uh, when Barbara <laughs> Walters was still the Today Show host. And the things that they said to her, even in that power position, they, they just treated her like you know, a, a talking face. Uh, and the fact that they called her an aggressive expletive, right? They would have never said that about John Chancellor because, you know, if you want to get your way in network TV, you have to be forceful. And she was one of only a handful of women in network TV at that time. So she wasn't, she couldn't sit down and be this very pleasant and, you know, genteel wallflower and expect that the news editors from the network were going to, you know, bow to her wishes. So. Moving on to the Hollywood industry, I want to say October 5th, 2017, when the story broke about Harvey Weinstein. Now, you know, I was still here when the story broke about Roman Polanski. Now, that's actual criminal activity that just did kind of get wiped off of the uh, criminal um, ledger because they said, well, the statute of limitations has expired, so they're not going to, you know, pursue prosecution against Mr. Polanski. But between a Anita Hill and all these other cases that happened that got fairly good public, public, public publicity, Roger Ailes, of course, O'Reilly. You know, why was it that the Harvey Weinstein in situation really in 
told people that, you know, it's time to come out of the shadows. It's time to just say, look, there's no sense in keeping this a secret anymore. I, you've experienced this. I know other people that have experienced this. And then it was probably four or five days later while I was sitting at my desk up on the second floor. And I said, oh, you know what? This is not going to stop. This has gone past a tidal wave and now it's a tsunami. So I want to just keep track of some of this. So, so I think the first Excel spreadsheet that I, that I started and passed out among the diversity committee had maybe 20 names on it or something. And what Lena's scrolling behind you um, is that list now, which some of, the, some of the names that have a white background are incidents that came to public knowledge prior to Harvey Weinstein. Everything that you see that has a tan background happened from October 5th forward. And I thought it'd be easier to keep track of stuff as, you know, I would see it the next day and put it, but then every time you read a story, these stories refer to other incidents that go back years. And I said, okay, well, how about, you know, the Olympians? How about uh, state representatives? How about, uh, you know, Jane has already mentioned people from the press. And so this thing just continues to grow like a mushroom. I think uh, to answer Molly's question, what has happened in our industry, meaning the motion picture industry, where most of your people are essentially freelancers, there wasn't really the kind of HR structure that if you're a temporary employee on a TV show or a film, that maybe you felt empowered to go in and complain about, say, a Kevin Spacey or somebody like a Harvey Weinstein, especially if it's Weinstein's company. Now, within the halls of places like Paramount, Fox, Warner Brothers, trust me, all of that has been going on for years. The system basically was there to cover up those sorts of incidents because these were their money makers, these were their, you know, their brands. And if their brands get besmirched or found out or exposed, then that runs the audience away. So trust me, the only reason that this has taken on the kind of sincerity and severity is because also it's when you look at the talent agencies, they're also afraid of being sued because you couldn't have had the kind of behavior that a person like Weinstein or Spacey or some of these other, uh, I won't even call them gentlemen, I'll call them males, I won't even call them men, have, have actually committed without someone being there to cover that up, without the system saying, you know what, here's a pile of money, go quietly. Uh, and it's still to this day true that even if you do come out and voice your opinion, even in this era of Me Too, and, and, and what's the other one, the other hashtag, time's up, is that you still may be so-called blacklisted from getting additional work in the industry. Because one, we know that you'll litigate. And if you'll litigate, then that means that you could be a potential problem wherever else you land. Uh, it's, it's, it's easy for me to say, but I would still say the only way to keep this energy going is women and other victims, because some of these victims have been male, uh, to continue to speak up. Uh, because once it comes out of the headlines, once it's not lo no longer a story, then people kind of get comfortable in going back to their old behavior. And, you know, I think the uncomfortableness that most males and men would feel right now is good. I mean, this is not the first time that I've had to wonder, okay, so what in my every day, because I'm a flirt. I'll just put that on the record. Good morning, how are you? You look lovely today. So now do I have to reconsider my entire, you know, personality because it, because it may have offended somebody? Yeah, it's time for me to think about that. When I was here as an undergrad and that version of the women's movement was moving full force, I had to consider, okay, now am I holding the door for Molly because she's just the next person coming through the door or because I'm a chauvinist and I don't think she's strong enough open the door on her own or should I just let Molly open her own door? You know, we had to go, I mean, it wasn't the serious issue that you're dealing with now, I mean, but it was like, do I wait for Molly to ask me for a date or do I go up and ask Molly for a date? I mean, all of that behavior had to be rethought when that version of the women's movement took hold in the 60s and 70s. But this, I think, is much more critical and much more important that we take a very deep examination of everything we do and how we say and how we do. A lot of this goes back to prehistoric days. I mean, it's, it's based on the human race is only going to continue if two people get together and have children. But how 
that socialization process has evolved. A lot of our attitudes are still in, the, in caveman days. And I think that the brave women who've come forward and said, you know, this is, the, you know, I'm going to come out and say I was abused. I actually went to other women in certain cases, and other women said, you know, this, this is the way it is. And in our industry, the entertainment industry, trust me, many people were told that going back to the 20s. It's like, yeah, if you want to move up in this business, just, you know, just let it slide. So I'll end my remarks there, and we'll go on with uh, Lena Jaswell. questions of you all and then um, and then we can um, open it up to questions and I was hoping that this would be maybe more of a conversation style you know so if there are even comments or um, that the audience would feel comfortable in asking and even opening up a discussion but um, but the first thing I would like to know is like you know with any strong movement there's always a backlash mm -hmm. And it, what do you see, do you see a backlash happening right now in, in each of the ind individual industries or um, what, what kind of comments do you have about that? Mm -hmm. I think there's the danger of a backlash. I haven't seen it yet. Uh, Garrison Keillor, uh, you know, who's again a prominent mm -hmm. person said, you know, this is just ordinary conduct. And then they came back on, you know, you know who he is obviously. I told Lena that I went. I was delighted to go to the screening of the Post uh, movie, and Meryl Streep was asked about this, and she said she thought a backlash was inevitable, uh, and that that was disturbing, at least in her industry. You know, I I come back to this point about systemic change, and in fact, I was thinking I was going to send an email to a couple of journalists I know because I thought, wait a minute, what is going to happen on these investigations, mm -hmm. and I actually am more concerned about that than about backlash. I, I think it's, it's, it's a problem in the sense that people may begin to say, oh, you know, does this mean I can't, I can't say this or say that, when in fact we're talking about something that is against the law. Yeah. And, and I, I am an optimist. I do, sh I do share and want to share something, which was that, you know, I, I wrote a piece for, about working at Fox News and about Roger Ailes. And um, a year later, 21st Century Fox uh, was found out that they had re-signed Bill O'Reilly after promising to clean house because he was valuable to them. And I got a lot of attention for going on CNN. I heard from famous anchors. I heard from former women students of mine for simply saying, this is against the law. 21st Century Fox needs to enforce the law. And I think we're so screwed up, frankly, about whether this is about sex or whether this is about something else. This is about power. This is about abuse Absolutely. of power. And I feel as if we are still so confused as a society about this that um, the fact that this is against the law needs to be said over and over and over again. And somehow the secrecy of these settlements has silenced these victims. Um, I'm not exactly answering your question, but I was thinking about it because we need a change where these women are not held to silence and we need to find out what are these organizations doing to change their behavior. I would say yes, there's invariably going to be a backlash. I think some of the backlash is um, about the um, uh, conflicting concepts that are part of this conversation. So I <laughs> approach this partly uh, from the perspective of a researcher that measurement is important. So defining the concept of what constitutes harassment um, is a very important and I think sometimes difficult thing to do. And I tell my students when, we're, uh, when they're taking their research class, <laughs> that just because a concept is difficult to measure and difficult to define and difficult to operationalize doesn't mean that you should shy away from it, that you should continue to attempt um, to do that. And so I think part of what the backlash is is that there's not a common understanding of the terms that we're talking about. So we can be talking about illegal behavior and then quickly shift to talking about something that seems much more subjective um, and I think the backlash is not knowing 
where you stand and feeling as though you might inadvertently be on the wrong side of a conversation. In that way, I think part of um, preventing the backlash, because that would not be constructive or helpful, is to think of the conversation also as one that's inclusive and that is not an us versus them kind of conversation. That there are people who are reflecting on their own behavior and thinking, that probably wasn't an appropriate thing to do. I'm not going to do that in the future. That doesn't make you a, the, an enemy. That doesn't make you the bad guy. That makes you part of the solution. And I think um, we need to think of the conversation moving forward as inclusive rather than as only shaming and blaming because we, in ver we need allies. We need people who are kind of committed to, to change, but talking about then what is that change and how does something feel from a different perspective, those are more nuanced conversations. I think that's where the backlash comes in, is feeling as though there's so much gray area. And, um, and so I guess my hope in minimizing the backlash is that we approach the more difficult aspects of this conversation, the gray area or the nuance, with an attitude of trying to build alliances, that there are a lot of people who want to do the right thing. And having a conversation about that can be hard. Um, but I think stigmatizing people um, rather than inviting uh, change contributes to the backlash. Well, um, I agree with what my colleagues have already brought forth. I, I would say the thing that surprised me the most, having spent 25 years full time in LA in the business, was how swiftly, after Harvey Weinstein, that not only did his board dismiss him, he was kicked off uh, out of his own company. Every project that had his name or his company's name attached to it basically dropped him. I mean, he couldn't have fallen faster if he jumped out of a 747 at altitude. Uh, of course, his wife said, oh, Harvey, we're going to meet in court. So, and this was all without a, any sort of system of due process. So you'll see on the spreadsheet that I have a Y and an N for whether there was due process. So in most cases, more, the, more your more recent accusations, there have been internal investigations, and as Jane mentioned earlier, maybe we'll see the results of that and maybe we won't. Uh, I don't doubt, uh, but in maybe one case, um, that the accusations against uh, these men were actually true. So now they're going to be countersuits. You know, my, my reputation has been, mis been besmirched. Uh, I lost X amount of uh, X millions of dollars of revenue and so forth and so on. I'm a pariah and I'll never be able to get back into this business and someone's gonna have to pay for this. So that's gonna be certainly part of this process as it goes back and forth. Um, the other question that comes up uh, as it relates to some of these uh, women now, that some of these incidents happened when they were fairly young, new to the business, and that's the perfect situation for a person of power to pray on someone who's trying to build their career. And then people who are so-called civilians in this always ask, well, why didn't you come forward with this information sooner? Well, I know from sitting in court with my friend who was, who was, who was raped that the system at the time and probably now isn't more friendly to you as the real victim. They just re-victimize you. So that's one reason to stay silent. The other reason is if you really want to progress in this competitive field, you have to keep quiet about this, you know, especially when most of these young women came into the industries and just shut up because that's, that's how you move up one way or the other. So, and I'd always wondered about some of these actresses who were excellent, but then they kind of fell off the radar. Now it all makes sense, you know, because some people say, you know what, I'm not willing to do that. So there's going to be a, a backlash, I think, uh, and, but I think whatever that process looks like, in the end it's going to be worth it because I think uh, I'd be very disappointed, as Molly has said, if we just kind of go back to business as usual without any real substantive change. I assure you every HR office in this country is looking at the fact that what you said is true. This is illegal. So what is the reporting process? And if someone comes forward with information about this person, are we culpable if we, you know, 
send them off or don't protect them or actually are agents in paying somebody off to, to you know to be quiet they're they're all looking at what they've done they're all going through those files and say you know i was also happy that when harvey weinstein was pulled off of his pedestal there were a lot of conversations a year or so before that said that the only reason say bill cosby came under that kind of scrutiny and attack was because he was an african-american i'm so happy that harvey got pulled off his pedestal and all these other people because no that's not why we came after you, Bill. We came after you because you were a drug-inducing rapist. That's why we came after you, okay? And we're gonna continue to come after anybody who thinks uh, Russell Simmons, he's getting ready to face a whole lot of heat because that is part and parcel of how the music business also mm -hmm. s sort of brings up their young ingenues or young stars. It's like, we're here to put pressure on you and whoever responds favorably to that pressure. And I'm not trying to just point the finger at the entertainment industry because there are a lot of academic institutions on that Excel spreadsheet as well. So it's, it's part of the power uh, principle. I would say when we have true diversity in this and we have true, um, I would say, veracity, so we've got, we've definitely all, all we've always had man on, on woman We've had man on man. Uh, if, if this continues, we'll also hear about girl on girl. Because that, that's or also- women on women. Women on women. That, 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 is, that is a reality in the entertainment industry as well. I, I wanted to ask you all also a follow up on this that you, were, you led me to this was, you know, we actually haven't really heard so much for, about the music industry. I mean, we hear about Russell Simmons, right. but that's a surprising thing to me is that why are these, you know, sort of fields elevated where others aren't and do you think that there are fields where this won't this af this movement won't affect like business or you know well I, I just i would just jump in the music business now is really almost entirely freelance yes we do have record companies but it's it's not i don't think it was ever really like the movie and tv industry where you actually worked for capitol records or you work for rca or you work for columbia they basically you know, you use their studios, they processed your sound, they, you know, marketed your, your, your material. But now most of the, ar the artists now make more money touring. Uh, all of this is digital, you know, with Apple and Spotify and wh wherever else you download your music. So the question is, if you're in the music business and if you're working for a Russell Simmons record company or somebody like that, who do you complain to? I mean, they are essentially are the HR, the chairman of the board and everything. I mean, you can't really complain about their behavior to their infrastructure because everybody in that infrastructure is somebody that they've hired. So I think, they, I think most of those uh, women would feel less, on less solid ground. You know, they would have to literally go outside the system legally and then say, this, and this is what has happened in the Russell Simmons case, they actually filed suits as opposed to having someone within the structure to, to complain to. I think that perhaps one of the reasons it's touched on these three industries first, um, and you can add some others, is I think the more hierarchical the industry is mm -hmm. and the more the power dimension is exacerbated, the more conducive it is to this kind of behavior um, or incidents like this. I tell students who uh, come to talk about Capitol Hill internships, be prepared. The Senate is set up to be 100 kingdoms. And um, that is really how a lot of Senate offices are run. There is a, um, a figure at the top and every other member of the staff is in service of that figure. And having access, um, so those who are most senior and have most access to the leader then also acquire power through that. And um, I, I think that's true of media and, and true of Hollywood. It's probably very true in the military. It, there's other um, industries that are kind of structurally set up in a way that makes this, as I said, is very conducive or facilitates this. I, I, I don't, so I, I, I don't know that there are gonna be industries that aren't touched by it, but I think it's especially egregious in um, these kind of hierarchical industries where, as you said, there's also no, no outside resource or recourse because the person at the top is so powerful that the consequences for speaking out are so significant um, 
that there just really isn't, you know, the, the, there really isn't an avenue for recourse or, or to address it. Well, you know, I, I want to add to that that in, in television, particularly broadcast television, a lot has to do with performance and has to do with how you look. And unfortunately, until recently, there's been an incredible double standard. Uh, a man could age on television and be fine and be overweight. And the women used to tend to be all blonde, all younger. And so, you know, when I was at Fox News, I mean, Fox News, I was told later had something called the thigh cam, uh, which was to come right in on the legs of some of the women who, and you run into a real issue about this because I think that when a lot of people want a job, which is true of all of these things, and when they're still dominated by men, I mean, it is highly ironic that the so-called liberal media are still not there in any way on, on, I mean, we just had the first woman cinematographer, right? right? right. To win, to, to get nominated for right. the Oscar, we, right? You know, the, I read that the Motion Picture Academy is 72% white or something like that. Uh, media business is highly run by white guys, and I love white guys. Some of my best friends are white guys. <laughs> but until you have women in positions of power, and again, now maybe, you know, maybe women will abuse positions of power. That will be an interesting thing to see. I hope that's not true. But when you have a system in place where a lot of people want something, you've got a problem. And I know that at Fox News, um, there, and I ran into it when I wrote my piece for the New York Times about Roger Allen. I wrote a very measured piece about it. Um, I mentioned the way that, that women somehow, quote unquote, knew to dress, quote unquote, right? Not everybody dressed that way. I wasn't told to dress that way. Uh, I know that some, you know, some women were, were singled out in some way. If you wanted a career there and you were, you know, in the po a position where you wanted to advance, so you end up blaming women for wearing the short skirts. And then you're in a problem because is it their fault that they're wearing a short skirt? Is it their fault that they're wearing the plunging neckline? Uh, and television has been very guilty of that. So I think what's common to our industries is they're still run by, by a certain percentage of the population, and there's still a lot of people who want that. And I also think the consequences have not yet been there. Um, and that's really what I keep harping on. But, Fox News had a brutal public relations department. If a woman left and complained, we're not even talking, you know, abuse, they would come after you. And so, you know, until that shifts, you know, we, we're, I'm not sure where we're going to go. I'm just going to ask one last question, and if we could keep the answers brief, just um, because I want to open it up to the, the audience to have some time. Um, we have a lot of students in the audience. And what kind of advice would you give a student who is just graduating as an undergrad or in the master's program that is hungry to get their, fir their foot in their door and, um, but is concerned about these sorts of things coming up? So what kind of advice would you give to the students to be aware of? Well, this is easy advice for yeah. me to give because <laughs> um, I, it's the advice I would have given to myself 20 years ago, but it's easy to give the advice and not easy to follow it. Um, and that would be to, um, to have your voice. Um, I, I know every woman um, or lots of people who have experienced this then walk away having not said anything and almost as bad or humiliating as the comment was, was the negative feeling about yourself for not having spoken up and said anything. And then you lie in bed at night thinking, I have a hundred smart, you know, witty comebacks. I can't believe I didn't use any of them. And so um, it's not important to have the smart, you know, witty comeback. It's important to just very clearly um, hold your ground and say that you won't be treated that way. Uh, and that is, uh, that sounds very simple and it's incredibly difficult. Um, but just anecdotally, I w will say I, I did have an experience after I'd had a, a couple of jobs where I felt as though I was really treated very badly in a conversation. Um, and it was abusive, but I wouldn't, I, I don't know how gender specific it was. It was just a very kind of, humiliating, um, demeaning uh, uh, critique. 
And I was a little older, and so I experienced it a few times before and regretted not saying anything. And I said something. And I said, you know, I, I take responsibility for that mistake, but I don't talk to me as though I'm not, as I'm, you know, not an intelligent contributing member to the team. I actually, I mean, this is maybe too Pollyanna-ish, but I actually got a phone call that evening and an apology. And that person has gone on to be a real mentor to me. And that's a part of what I meant about this conversation being not labeling us versus them. People mm -hmm. engage in behavior that they regret. Um, and I think giving people the benefit of the doubt to call them on it and to say, I don't like the way you're speaking to me and I, I, I won't be talked to like that. It's very difficult, but to be able to say it short and simply and hold your ground, I think is the beginning of you feeling empowered, but also of you being respected in your workplace and also, you know, ultimately the thing that leads to the systematic change that we all, that we all need is to not go away secretly, but to really um, uh, voice um, when a transgression has occurred, even if it's a, a, what you feel is a minor one compared to what's being exposed. I would just say I, I learned from Professor Williams, uh, uh -oh. <laughs> different Professor Williams. I learned oh, from you all the time. <laughs> uh, we were talking. I think we need to have uh, training for students. I think there are things, sure. there are things, you know, I have a 21 year old daughter. This has become real, real. She wants to go out to LA and uh, she's really talented, but boy, you know, what if she's in a situation where she's something bad? might happen so it's very real to me right now it's always been real but it's very real and we were talking that there are things you can tell somebody to say you know it doesn't have to go I'm suing you right. which is what Molly did uh, which is what Molly did not do but you know to, to not go you know to not put yourself in a situation where you are alone with somebody to say hey you know uh, what's up with you here for doing this or hey, you know, just to kind of a hey, because it obviously is unconscious. How the heck it can be unconscious is sort of mystifying. But I really think we need, you know, students, um, we need to give some, there's some practical tools. You know, it's like, gosh, we used to teach our kids about stranger danger, right? Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, there are things we could, we could tell people. So it does escalate, though, often. And so I don't think we should assume it gets better immediately. But I think just some practical tools. Sure, uh, like, you know, our generation was taught ways to, when you're in situations like that, how to smile and de-escalate it right. and like laugh a little, mm -hmm. even though you're fuming inside. And that's now not we, that's not good, right? You know, so now we need to train this generation to be able to do the things like that. I mean, Molly Hillary Clinton suggested. didn't even know if she could turn and say, back off creep, yeah. when Donald Trump was right, right. in yeah. her right. face. Yeah. She went home, she worried about it, according yeah. to her book. I mean, there is a woman who might have been president of the United States, and there probably would have been cause to her yeah. turning and saying, hey, creep, back off. Real quick response. Just put Devil Wears Prada on an endless loop. <laughs> and you'll be fortunate if you get a boss that is as intense as the Meryl Streep character, but at least explains to you why she's unsatisfied with what you've done. The other thing I know from working with hard directors is some people really thrive on the fact that if they can take advantage of you, they're gonna just use you as their kickball. So the first time it happens, okay, maybe they're having a bad day. You know, maybe um, they just got a call from their agent, maybe their significant other gave them some, some, you know, sold them something they didn't like. Okay, the second time it happens, that's when I, I think that you should take Molly's advice. Made that mistake, own up to it, but please, uh, I, you can't talk to me like I'm a kid. And once they find out that they can't push you around, generally speaking, then they start to have more respect for you because everybody comes in there and, and almost as an invertebrate. Once they find out that you have a spine, then the real people will like respect that and move on. And if you lose a few jobs, because it is a freelance business, you're gonna lose that job eventually. Just understand, at the end of the day, you can still look at your face in the mirror and and be proud that you stood your ground. This is where we are in history right now. Thank you. So I wanted to um, open it up if anybody had comments or questions. That I'll walk right, over. No I still have plenty. <laughs> yeah. 
Hi, um, is this on? Okay, okay. hi. Um, so I just wanted to bring up one point in that when we're talking about everything that's going on with sexual misconduct in the media, a lot of the um, news has focused on legacy media, traditional media, mm -hmm. mainstream media, but not so much on like these younger shops where things are happening, especially like things that are going on at Vice because we think of like these new, young, hip upstarts not doing that sort of thing. And even in the 90s when I was coming up, all of us loved the source and wanted to work at the source mm -hmm. in our early 20s and everything, but Kim Osorio sued them for like $25 million. So can you talk a little bit about why students not should be looking for this to happen everywhere, but why they should be aware that this isn't just happening at legacy media, but it's happening in newsrooms where people in their 20s and 30s are leading the shop too? I think it goes to, you know, again, um, bravo to the New York Times for breaking the vice story. And, you know, I, I think I think we need to open our minds, and we need to open students' minds to the fact that it isn't only legacy media, that that cool mm -hmm. hip startup can hurt you too. I, mean, I just think we need to tell people, and you know, that vice example is, is so powerful, and it's, uh, in many ways, the, the high-tech industry is still, you know, there have been lawsuits brought by women who work in high-tech, but right. all this kind of, we're gonna, you know, have a hip shop. I mean, I think we need to warn, you know, we need to warn students. Uh, Look out for your, you know. Look out for wherever you are. It, you don't have to be old to engage in this behavior. So we ought to tell them. I guess would be my answer. I, I, w I would say agreeing with with Jane that you don't even have to think about the entertainment industry as a specific abuser. Just the workplace. I mean, as human beings, we're all in a hierarchical space. All right, and someone wants to be the top dog and everybody else you know sort of like uh, Molly's example in the Senate you know the fiefdom falls in line under that so some of these people were not the football captain they weren't the valedictorian valedictorian rather they so they so-called good couldn't get the girl maybe they were nerds before that was a, a term then all of a sudden, they've done well in college, they've done well in their career, now they're running some sort of shop or they're supervised. Now all of a sudden they have power. They want to exercise this power. A lot of that comes from somebody didn't dance with them in middle school. There's a line in um, Oliver Stone's Nixon that says he had men dying in Vietnam because he didn't get to play varsity football at Whittier College. So that is going on just because human beings are competitive and one-upmanship is part of being a human being. Part of it was from survival, but mostly now it's just, you know, social climbing. And just who can we keep under our thumb? And the guys who never had any sort of power over women now all of a sudden have artificial power over women. And they're going to exercise it. And that's, that applies to the federal government. That applies to the... The, the, the grounds crew here at, at American U, that applies to the White House, that applies to NASA, anywhere. As long, as long as men and women are in a closed workspace and men and men and women and women are in a closed workspace, there's going to be some sort of power differential and someone's going to try to exercise that. That's what I can tell you from experience. I think that um, it's um, maybe particularly surprising for young women um, uh, going into an environment that they expect to be different because um, it's younger, it's hipper, it's to all of a sudden encounter, the, you know, the bro environment of right. um, maybe I expected this if I went to work um, at a, you know, bank in New York City with lots of older white men in very privileged positions, but I came to this cool, you know, upstart where I thought everybody was going to sort of have a different role. And so it's particularly surprising and shocking um, and um, I think that I, I agree with what's been said but my contribution to that is to not just be telling young women to expect that but to really turn the onus on young men right. about why that culture is acceptable I mean just on a personal level as the mother of a teenage boy who goes to a boys school I, I, I feel like I'm conscious of those messages all the time about what leadership is and about what tacit passive um, uh, acceptance of 
um, cultural norms, you know, means. And I, I, so I think the education piece certainly should go out to young women so that it's not sort of shocking or surprising, although I don't think they would find it that way anymore. I mean, the stories that come out of Uber and, you know, all these kind of cool new um, companies are horrifying, just as horrifying as they are, you know, from the United States Senate or from Fox News. Um, but that education and awareness has, I mean, it absolutely has to be directed at young men. Right. right. Um, and, uh, uh, and so that's, I think, been a little bit of a missing piece of this conversation sure. is, sure. It, it, why is that acceptable? Why is that bro culture um, acceptable and cool at a certain yeah. level? And um, until we really expose that, I don't think anything we can do for young women in terms of telling them what to mm -hmm. expect mm -hmm. or how to arm themselves, I, I, I don't think, you know, that's just a temporary band-aid on a much bigger, more systemic problem. That's yeah. right, because it's only recently that on college campuses have college administrations taken these frat houses to task. And so that frat house culture is essentially what you see in some of these new upstart companies. It's just basically now we have a budget, you know, yeah, and, 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 and so we can, well, we can behave this way in better looking clothes, and, but it's the same mentality. And I would also yeah. say um, for Molly's point, like I think that's why for some of us, the Aziz Ansari story hit so hard Absolutely. Mm. because mm. we thought he was a feminist, an ally, you know, um, all of these kinds of things. So we sort of assume just like the workplace culture he was going to be one that was going to be one of the good guys He's that gonna was going to be sticking yeah. Yeah, yeah sticking up for us i think we have just one uh, comment or question before we have to wrap up just a quick comment and then a question i really appreciated what molly said um because i have a 10 month old son um and so my i feel like part of my contribution to the systemic problem like jane was saying is raising a son um in this world to respect women and to make a difference so um i i've just really appreciated that um, my question is um what is your advice when we're talking with friends and family who don't believe these women you know i find it um somewhat frustrating to talk to people that I love and respect who um, don't believe what th these women are saying, um, who think that some of these men are well respected or um, that maybe the woman did something to deserve this. Because if we, if we can have conversations where hopefully we're being change makers with what we're saying just in everyday life, maybe that would make a difference too. So I just wonder what you think about that. I try to have a conversation with those people <laughs> if I could, uh, and you know I thought it was highly regrettable that the Roy Moore story got you know to the point where they were asking whether those women who accused him were Democrats or Republicans. Right. And that was obscene to me. Um, I, I guess I would try if you have the patience to say you know what do you think these you know tell me more and try to see if you could get at why people are still blaming the women or why they think the women have an ax to grind. Why don't they believe the women? Why do they believe the man? I mean, it's not an easy thing to do, but it might be worth trying. I think the challenge that you raise is one that we face in all kinds of social change of confirmation bias, of people wanting to continue to believe the mental model that they have, that this isn't really happening and there might be some isolated cases but this isn't systemic, and so all of these women can't be, they're exaggerating or they're seeing it from a different point of view. And so being able to sort of aggressively um, and effectively uh, address confirmation bias and get people to sort of think of this differently, I mean, I, I think a personal narrative is extremely compelling um, way to break through and to, instead of kind of a lot of facts and figures, um, find a piece that they could read about somebody who, I mean, even what Lena started with, I mean, is a very um, hard to deny, much deeper, more emotional, that might make you feel less defensive and put yourself in somebody else's shoes and experience it from their role. Uh, so I think it's a very big challenge. I think we have to continue the conversation. I think we shouldn't continue it in anger, though. I think we should continue it with the hope of kind of moving together. Those people are our potential allies if we approach them the right way. 
we're going to have to. Um, unfortunately, we're out of time, so we're going to wrap up. I just wanted to say thank you so much to our panelists for being here and doing this. And also, we have a whole host of, of folks here who've made this work. I want to thank Jeffrey Madison, Tom Fish, Sean Schroth, Charles Leggett, Indira Mohabir. I'm sorry if I'm butchering names, um, Robert Boyd, Matt Fries, Amelia Tyson, Aaron Duran, um, the Diversity Committee, Priya Dosi, uh, Travon Homer, Ingrid Grant, and you sing, I think is here as well. And so, um, and the last thing I'd like to do is just to let you know about some other events that the Diversity Committee is sponsoring and the School of Communication are sponsoring. This coming Wednesday, um, January 31st at 6.30 in the theater is a film called An Outrage. It's about um, lynching in, in the American South. It's a really devastating film. So um, the filmmakers will be there as well. So I'd, I'd welcome you to come. It's sponsored by the Center for uh, Media and Social Impact, the School of Communication, College of Arts and Science, um, School of Public Affairs, and the Diversity Committee. And we also have uh, on February 15th in the theater as well at 6.30, the Kerner Report, 50 years later. And um, our own Professor Sherry Williams will be leading that discussion with a host of um, of panelists, I'm not gonna, in lieu of time, you can find all of this on the School of Communications website. And one last one, February 21st, uh, Wednesday, 21st? 21st, um, a film on Boko Haram, The Journey from Evil, film screening and discussion, again, also in the theater. So we hope to see you at some of these other events and um, thank you panelists for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Always a pleasure, Jane. Thank you. Never too busy. Thank you.